Welcome to Tanya Lacey Online and I'm really excited today to have joining me the one and only Alistair McDonald. Hello Alistair. Thanks Tanya, I appreciate being here and it's great uh, being reconnected as, uh, as, as much as we are at the moment. Awesome. So Alistair and I have been in each other's world for a few years now. It started with the personal development journey and then we started to do some business together and then you came on board in my team uh, with our Intercept program, Intercept experiences and facilitating in that. And then recently we started talking about your programs and the stuff that you're doing in your world and I really I wanted to talk today and share you with the community in our discussion with the community on the topic of agreements. So that was the basis of the discussion today. Are you up for a conversation about uh, agreements? Absolutely, Tanya, and I very much appreciate you taking this time to have the conversation. Awesome. So what we would like to talk about with you guys in our community is the concept of, or the question, why is it that people find it difficult to keep their agreements and the way that agreements happen in business and in life, uh, personally and professionally, and how they can set us up for uh, things going off the rails uh, or things working out well. This is what uh, the topic is today. So Alistair, did you want to kick off with um, maybe your thoughts on what you've seen go well uh, with agreements in, in business and relationships? Yeah, thanks, Tanya, and that's a, that's a great place to start. I, I love to focus on the positives all the time. I guess we don't live in a world where it's always that way, and, and sometimes it's, it's, it's appropriate to, to deal with some stuff that we don't love. In this case, though, yeah, I have a great story, and um, it's got many layers, and, and I could tell it for a long time. However, the short version is that I've been in business for nearly 20 years, and or been in businesses for nearly 20 years that I've been involved in starting and, and managing and, and operating in and so on. And during that time, I've had one business partner throughout. Uh, I've had other partners along the way and uh, maintain great connections with the vast majority of them. Um, but that one relationship in particular has been so close and so deep and so powerful that um, I use it uh, now working as a coach myself. I use it as, as a basis for, for many conversations on partnership and on agreements. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I want to go to a place we talked about yesterday. You go as deeply or as keep it as light as you want to. But we started talking about our friendship and the first time that you kind of entered into this agreement or an unspoken agreement with someone who was a friend. And as we were chatting about that, I myself had had a whole thought process and it come to mind with in my world. But... Do you want to talk about how our early experiences shape us and, um, you know, how that sets us up for agreements in, you know, in our business and personal life? Absolutely. Thanks, mm -hmm. Tanya. And just at this point, I hope it's okay. I just wanted to, to say that uh, what I loved about the conversation yesterday was being reminded of, um, of your ability to, uh, to help me and I, and I know everyone else really draw on experiences that can can help shed light on things now or help guide now. So that was, uh, that was a fantastic experience. Again. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so when I thought back to the first agreement that I had, let's say conscious agreement that I had uh, that I could reflect on, and it was a friendship, which is still alive today. So it's, it's a good 40 year plus friendship. Okay. And uh, really, I, as I was growing up, I had I, I always had a lot of connections, and I had well, I thought I had a lot of friends. Um, I also had a lot of fights, <laughs> and a lot of disagreements, and and so what I found was most of my relationships were quite volatile. Let's say, mm -hmm. um, whereas this one was one of um, very few where it was very consistent, and you know we were almost like brothers. You know, we met at primary school. Um, uh, we, we lived on different sides of the creek, so not different sides of the track, but almost. Um, and somehow, though, we came together and, and, and connected in a way where it felt like a, a genuine brotherhood. And this guy um, was a quieter guy and, and an only child and, and, and probably used to living in the world of adults. So at school, when, when, he, when it came to, to the fray, he wasn't always... Um, he didn't always go out and defend himself. 
physically. I was very good at that and, and I found myself standing up for him at times. So some of my fights were actually defending him. Mm. And so I can see, again, with your help, I could see how that experience and that relationship and, and you know, I love that relationship. Um, I still love that relationship and I can see how that set me up for future relationships of a similar nature. Mm, it's so subtle and so powerful and I think this is where if you take a slither of time now and you look at, okay, you know, for all of us, myself, yourself, anyone listening to this, where we're at now and how, how the relationships around us work and where the delta is, where the gap is around our expectations and then how the relationship's working. And then you bring to that, okay, your own experiences of relationships and what I call connectology, you know, how deep that connection is. And even if it's a balanced connection, so for instance, you know, you might have over-invested more than the other person, but in your brain, um, you know, it's even, but in their brain, it's not. And then you're bringing those experiences into uh, your world today. And then all of a sudden, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's the invisible aspects of the relationship and the agreements shaped on things that have happened to us in our past that, have started, that, that actually affect you know, how we move forward and how we, the foundations that we create. And this is sort of a subtle but powerful distinction between the conscious and unconsciousness of agreement, right? Totally. And look, you nailed a lot of important things to me in what you said there. And the one that jumped out at me relates exactly to my own business partnership. Okay. So because my business partner and I have, a, have been able to make it work successfully for 20 years and without any major traumas, you know, we've been challenged many times and we have gone head to head at times. In fact, we went to head recently in our largest business only last year. And it was the toughest experience we've had like that. And you know what, in the middle of it all, we sat down together and we acknowledged the, our relationship and we acknowledged that whatever our stance was at that moment in time, the relationship still came first. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 what would I call it? The um, opposite of that, basically we took, so we took that belief into every other partnership or relationship we formed and they rarely worked. Okay. Like, Interesting. Yeah. And they certainly never worked in the same way. Okay. And what the thing that you suggested there was exactly what we determined. And that was that even though it hadn't been stated, there was an agreement mm -hmm. and we had an expectation on that agreement. The other party or parties had an expectation and the two did not match. And, and even more strangely in a way, uh, I can think of one example where we felt like the other parties involved wanted more. Mm -hmm. at the time later we realized they wanted less and the reason why they wanted less is because they didn't want as much responsibility as we thought they wanted so there were so many assumptions for both parties and and ironically that one ended up foul we ended up in court so okay really interesting mm. so what we're what if, if just listening to you what i'm drawing out of that is uh unconscious expectation a stated expectation, like the stuff that's actually discussed, like the, the conscious dialogue, the conscious discussion versus what's not said. So there's what's said, there's what's not said. And we are talking about a very tangible world of business, yet the things that drive business are, are the intangibles. They're the, the thoughts, they're the emotions, they're the energy, the spirit, the ethos behind the agreement. And, you know, I'm really wanting from this discussion to kind of bring all this to the surface because I feel this is where your work is really powerful. You're helping people become aware of the agreements that glue their life together. Yeah, and that's a fantastic way of putting it. As always, Tony, you put it better than I do. So, um, again, you're exactly right. We, so we thought we were good guys going into a situation with good, a good heart and, and good expectations. And, and essentially our expectation was we are dealing with peers. We're dealing with people who are at our level, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's this, there's typically a very hierarchical view of the world when it comes to business. And we didn't, we didn't want to build a business that way. 
we wanted to build a business where it was friends in business together as we'd achieved. And so uh, again, we later realized that the other guys didn't feel they were at a, the same level as us. And, and unfortunately, because of the way the relationship ended, we never explored what the differences were. However, it became clear that they, they saw it a different way. And, uh, and there were many levels where there was not agreement and, and things like tolerance to risk um, and things and absolutely values play a massive, massive part in this. Um, you know, most of the focus in business is on the tangibles. People are happy to talk about the dollars. The who's gonna, yeah, who's going to earn the dollars? Who's going to take to bring take the dollars? You know, who's going to do this job, that job, the other job? And so far, I've rarely had the conversation about real responsibility and about values and about um, core, core personal drivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, we 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 realised even when it comes to our suppliers, our accountants, our lawyers, anyone that's working with us if their drivers in life are too different from ours, then they, they cannot represent us or they cannot advise us in a way that makes any sense to us. Mm-hmm. So this yeah. goes deep and it, and it goes broad. Well, it's really interesting because you know that we have a saying at Intercept, you know, that language shapes culture. And here we're talking about stuff that people haven't got language for. Right. And so and I love this. In fact, I think we should do a series on this. I'm just putting it out there uh, because this is quite broad okay right and you know this is the first the first piece to it if people like it you know we will do more so we want to put language to this uh, language to some intangible things and if I may I don't even think you know we do a lot of work in business small medium and large I don't even think or really know if most people even get what a value is or what ethos is or like what it even means that like what do you, what are your values and what do you value and because it's it is intangible not only that um so i agree again and so not only they're intangible it's i find people have a different face now faces and masks it's not unusual for humans it's, it's, a, it's a normal way for us to to operate however i find a real people making that distinction between who they are in business or who they are in the workplace and who they are at home. Mm-hmm. And, and again, there's so many, you know, there's this, there's so many people that wouldn't go near their work colleagues outside the workplace. <laughs> and yet given the opportunity to go out and have a few drinks and be a bit silly, they'll do that. So there's all, there's all these, there's all these to me, strange perceptions of relationship that, that, that vary when, it, when we consider it personal versus when we consider it business. Mm-hmm. You're right. There's a lot of intangibles. And just one of the things when it comes to, to what you just said that actually bothers me, and it's certainly one of the, my drivers for, for talking about this, is that the law has a very clear language for all of this. Mm-hmm. And that language, it has words like agreement. It has words, words like reasonable. <laughs> it has a whole lot of words that, sound human and sound like they are there to achieve uh, you know, an outcome that's mutually beneficial. However, my experience with that language is that it's about control and it's about, it's about limiting and it's about directing rather than facilitating healthy relationships. Mm. And, you know, sometimes people will... Like, if you talk about money, okay? So money is an, is an agreement. Money is... I do this for you, you will pay me this. Mm. And that is the agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, But sometimes money can make us lazy because it's like, well, you know, you haven't paid me or... But if the agreement wasn't set up properly in the first place, then that there's sometimes there's a blockage in the thought process of the payer or they feel that there was uh, some... um, shortfall in the delivery or the outcome wasn't achieved so they might withhold the money and use that as the as the the lever but actually because they didn't put the pre-work in and really set up the context and make sure that there was alignment before they you know jumped into the agreement uh, that in some respects money can kind of make us 
lazy and I'm just looking for kind of the, the things that exist in society that we, we use to contain us like the law and like money and which can in some ways maybe even make us a bit lazy because we just like, well, I'll buy you that or I'll, 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 I'll you know, I'll, you know, I'll buy that. I'll buy, I'll buy that protection or I'll buy the legal or I'll, this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know. Does this link you with what you're saying? Or I'll buy you flowers because you're mad. <laughs> it's okay. Hang on. I'll buy you flowers because you're mad. Yeah. Is that what you said? Okay. Rather than having a conversation, work it through. Let's get to the right. mis- disconnection, misunderstanding. That's right. Um, okay. Yeah, or, or, or I'm giving you these flowers because I, just, I can't express how I feel about you better than flowers. Uh-huh. No words for it. So, um, so the, what the concept, that, and now I'm going to be frank, you came up with that concept, not me. And, it's, and I love it. And it's, it is very powerful. So I, the way I was, I was thinking of money was it's absolutely a tool of leverage. Okay. And so my, here, my belief is that we are all in business to, to express our love for other people. Okay. You know, so that's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's, that's, and that's our, that is, that is, to me, that is the human driver. Our, our driver is to express love and to receive it. So give mm-hmm. it, receive it. Mm-hmm. That's it. You know, mm-hmm. we, we eat, we sleep. There's the basic survival mechanisms and there's, 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 there's research, some of it not nice, suggesting that love is one of those core needs. Mm-hmm. So I believe that that expression is why we, any of us go into business. Mm-hmm. And so then absolutely, the money is just a way of now leveraging that and saying, well, okay, you can, you're not going to give me back love or the love you give me back is not going to feed me. So you're going to give me something that's abstracted from that idea instead. Okay. So it's abstract, it's leverage. And ironically, it becomes in itself a, 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 a problem and, and the centre of so many, so many discussions and disagreements and arguments. And um, even though it's just a tool, it's just a facilitating tool. Okay. I don't know if I responded properly to what you were saying. No, no, no. Well, we've got about three or four concepts in there, right? Because we started talking about the law and then I got a picture of a wall and then, you know, we were talking about a few things and I brought in money. So it's all, it's all relative. Mm. Okay. So um, I guess the, 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 the theme of today is about agreements and, you know, the conscious agreements, the unconscious agreements, the ones that we take for granted. And I, th- I think what we're saying is that money could potentially just be an agreement that we take for granted and then if things go off the rails, we might bring the law in because we need the law to decide it. Yeah. Interestingly, oftentimes people end up in mediation anyway, which if they'd done the conversation at the beginning, they wouldn't have ended up with mediation at the end, which yeah. is a rebalancer. And I think what we're saying is if you put the time, effort and energy at the front end and make your agreements more conscious, that's where it's going to uh, pay, pay dividends, for want of a better term, for, for, you know, for everyone. Absolutely. You're mm. absolutely right, Tanya. And, and I want to be clear, I don't sit here, I'm not sitting, I'm sitting at the same level as you and as everybody else. I'm not sitting on some pedestal because I know all about it. Yeah. Um, it's, I've, be, I've become aware of this because I guess because I've had so many unconscious agreements and then as I became conscious, I started to break a lot of them. Okay. Or I was breaking them and then I became conscious that I was breaking them. Okay. So let's, let's go here. What are the signals to people that they, that, uh, that they're breaking an agreement? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the first one, the one that I thought about today. So today I went back into the gym for the first time in a couple Oh, of wow. Years. Congratulations. <laughs> so I made a commitment at the start of the year to myself. So I made an agreement with myself and, mm-hmm. and to, to some people at the gym. And I have kept part of the commitment, but not all of it. I have, so I have not honoured the agreement. Okay. And only today, perhaps it's because you and I had the conversation yesterday. But yeah, I'll take the credit for that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I am, I'm feeling myself physically. Mm. Feeling... You know, I'm, I, was in, I was in amazing shape two years ago and I'm now in less than amazing shape. And the only reason why is I had an agreement with myself that I was honouring up till two years ago and then because of all the reasons and excuses that I can document in, you know, in, in, in many, many, many ways, I've let that go. Got it. And so I had a conscious agreement with myself to right. maintain a level of health and well-being and I have unconsciously let that slip. 
Great. So, do, do the quality of our agreements equal the quality of our life or is it the, the where we put the agreements in which parts of our life? Like, So, another word for agreement or, or a word that supports agreement is commitment. Okay. And absolutely the quality of our commitment is everything. Mm-hmm. So we are either committed is on or off. It's not partial or grey. It's yeah. on or off. We either are committed or we are not. Mm-hmm. So when we are not, anything is possible. Mm-hmm. When we're committed, only what we are committed to is possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Acceptable. Yeah. And there's another piece here about, you know, even in our work when people are saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing some, some work with you guys or, you know, we've been thinking about it. It's like, well, okay, you're, you're thinking about it. You've got some gaps. Do you accept the success of your business as a reflection of you? Yes. Are you prepared to resolve this issue that you've been been going around in circles on? Yes. Are you interested or are you committed? Because if you're interested, we're not going to work with you. If you're committed, then we can know we can get a result. Mm. (laughs) And it is about commitment. It is about commitment. And and we we say that. We want to work with people who are open and willing and committed. So it all lines up. And that's how you enter into the agreement based on the outcome or the objective that we're going for, that's in the business setting. And in life, um, I don't think that we consciously create... Our communication lets us down. We are our communication and our communication lets us down. I don't think we're taught this at school about agreements and about clear communication. No way. No, I mean, that's a great great acknowledgement. I feel like what we're taught at school is compliance. In mm-hmm. fact, I've got a daughter that gets in trouble now because every adult that she speaks to other than me is the word compliance too much. <laughs> and ironically, it bothers them that a 14-year-old is telling them that she's not into compliance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness, mate. <laughs> yeah. so, but that's what, that's what this education system is there to teach. Now, it's there to teach skills. Yeah. It's numeracy, literacy. There's social aspects to yeah. it, of course. So there's, there's, some, there's some valuable skills there, absolutely. Mm-hmm. However, there's also a framework of compliance. There's a framework of you becoming what society expects you to become, mm-hmm. you delivering on society's expectations of you. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not alone. I would say I'm a common case of someone that was capable at school. And... And, in, and, and my own responsibility, I failed in my own responsibility to find my own interest, my own passion there. Okay. So I took a negative attitude and reacted to it. Mm-hmm. And all that was ever really done was to attempt to bring me back into line. And because, of, because my attitude was a strong attitude, they were trying to work with me. They were trying to cajole me into it. <laughs> try. And yeah. Well, they, they tried because in my guts, it felt wrong. It mm-hmm. just felt wrong. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't explain. I didn't have the language to explain. I didn't, I didn't take it upon myself to learn that it took me a long time and people like you to wake me up to these things. So, so I don't want to bag school. No. Because it serves a, a massive purpose and, and there's so much evidence that the higher the levels of education then then the higher the quality of life, you know, mm-hmm. so not, not saying that it's just, there are some fundamentals like that, that I'm missing. Mm-hmm. And ironically, you know, I've got a friend with a daughter that, appears exactly like I was. <laughs> so a 14 year old girl that's like I was is quite scary to me, I've got to say. And so, um, so I sit there and think, well, what, what, what is it? What is it that's bothering her? And I think, well, okay, she's, she is, she's intelligent, she's strong, she's strong-willed. She, she wants her independence. And so all I feel she needs is a clear agreement with the people around her about what is expected of her, what she can expect, from those around her and an agreement that of how how any any uh let's call it failure is dealt with or how any any uh you probably got a better word tanya <laughs> so falling short of the agreement or not meeting the agreement so when things aren't met yeah that's right okay that's right. you meet it or you don't meet it and yeah. here's what happens when here's the consequences of not meeting the agreement Here's the consequences, and this, I think, is a big thing that's missing, not just with children at school, but in the workplace. Not only here are the consequences, but I... So, I'm an employer. I'm not an employee. Again, my attitude in life meant I was never going to be anyone's employee. Mm -hmm. So, as an employer, 
I don't want people to feel like I'm there to direct them because I don't like that feeling. Okay. And so if someone's breaking, falling short of the agreement, then that's a signal to me that there's something wrong with the agreement. There's nothing wrong with that person. There's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with the agreement. Okay. And so we need to rework the agreement. Right. And the communication around the, the agreement, right. the language around the agreement. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got and, it. And another powerful concept, and this was taught to me around the time we met, and that is the idea of consciously decommitting from agreements. Okay. Interesting one. All right. Let's talk about that. It's powerful. I, like that was such an eye opener to me because I was a rebel. You know, okay. you, know you, you, you don't consciously decommit, you consciously cause trouble. Okay. Agreement, right? But all of a sudden, I was starting to learn the idea of responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and particularly my own responsibility for me and for, my, for, for everything in my life. And so yeah, yeah. that concept of, um, again, when, when any agreement's not working, I've, I've, I've got three choices essentially. And one is to decommit totally. Mm-hmm. So let's just take myself out of the situation. Another choice is to recommit to the same agreement. Yeah. Okay. I looked at that agreement. Like, actually, going to the, like going to the gym? Like going to the gym. We've do <laughs> we got to do that every 1st of January, don't we? <laughs> An annual recommitment. <laughs> and then, see, so I got smart. I do mine in December. Like, I don't do it like everyone else. <laughs> so, and then, and then there's the idea of, of, reviewing the whole situation and then and then setting a new commitment you know Mm -hmm. so i guess they're the three options i see Mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right consciousness and communication and absolutely clear language those sorts of things are critical then yeah i love all that i jotted those down by the way and one in here just with you so let's go with the you're ready to uh, decommit or renegotiate or decommit i i feel that there is a a human way and you know you can have you can talk about a hard thing in a soft way you can you can handle a tough thing a brutal thing in a in a in an okay way where you're not smashing people you might be smashing the agreement you have to smash the people mm. and that's a concept called dissolving and you know we talk about that intercept dissolving emotional attachments that limit us uh, it dissolving it so allowing there to be a process of decommissioning the agreement rather than it just being like a cut and a chop and a, you know. And I think this is the source reason that so many relationships end in a dramatic way because we were not taught the communication of really expressing what's going on for ourselves, Mm. Um, the little mini agreements along the way that aren't being met or the expectations. And I know myself, I mean, I'm in my second marriage, that's exactly what happened with my my first marriage. I had all these you know, fantasies and expectations of what it would be like, including having children. That was on my end. But before we got married, we didn't sit down and have a conversation and say, uh, okay, so what's the plan about kids and get aligned on that? Like that, I didn't have the skills back then to have that discussion. Uh, and so there were a lot of assumptions made. We went into the into the relationship and then, you know, you're waiting and, and then, you know, did didn't happen so for for me I ended up my immaturity at the time or whatever it was I ended up for a whole host of other reasons and things that happened but it ended up being really a a cut and a chop and and he ended up being in shock uh, at the suddenness of me my complaint so I think I was complaining at the time because I knew that my end of my my bargain wasn't being met but in reality, we had not had an, an open agreement about that aspect mm. of our relationship. It wasn't a conscious agreement. Mm. And, and I can, you know, I, I've got a parallel myself. So, you know, I had a relationship in the end for 25 years and you were, you were more advanced than I was, Tanya, because we did talk about some things and I actually didn't like what I was hearing and yet I still went into the agreement. Okay. And so I had signals and I'm presuming that the other party had signals too. So I had signals that I that I chose to ignore to make it work, to do the right thing. To, you know, okay. So, so, so that's a, you know, that's that, that's an error. Like that's mm. it's just not going to help anybody. Um, and then and then of course what I what I decided on the back of that was that compromise was the art of a successful relationship. So I've I've accepted things that weren't right for me, and then I had to compromise who I was, what I wanted, 
how I wanted to do things to make that work. Mm. And, and that's all my responsibility. And, and what I can say is it takes more and more and more energy and there's less and less satisfaction. There's more and more disgruntlement that comes out of all of that. I like that. Is it, that's a word, disgruntlement. It is. It's we can cool. put that down. Uh, I, I picked up two things, if I may. Yeah. Uh, we've been chatting about this is uh, compromise. Yes. Does it really work? And also what is the right thing? And, you know, I grew up in a Catholic environment, went to Catholic school, had all the Catholicism world, and then I ended up getting married in a fishing club and not in a church on my 21st birthday in a red dress. And, <laughs> and in my mind, uh, it was a form of marriage. It wasn't in a church and it wasn't before God. And, you know, so in my brain, I think I already had a hedge strategy that I'd never come clean about because I was not 100%. Yet didn't have the skills to, at the time, the communication skills, the setting up an agreement skills, and that cost me a big chunk of my time in my life. And it wasn't until, you know, uh, an argument and a really a, a negative peak thing occurred, which was my, okay, this is actually um, my moment. And I, he was at work and I negotiated, if only I'd used the same negotiating skills with him, but I was over it by then, but I actually negotiated with the next door neighbour to take all my stuff from the house, pop it in their garage, close the garage, hopped in my car and headed down to, to Melbourne. And then he was calling me, where are you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm going back to, to Melbourne, I'm leaving you. And it was I, was, I felt so strongly that I had really compromised and I had really gone against myself and I was doing the right thing and for me who is big spirited and very intuitive I was stuffing down my my truth and I ended up getting very very sick as a result of that and my my body was doing crazy things and it was like no this is not right my body was screaming at me mm. so I think we know mm. we know if we stop and we tune in you know what we we need to do for ourselves and our own alignment is just then having the skills to be able to have the conversation with other people where we can communicate our truth and this is where i don't think society or i mean we're going about it in our work we're equipping people to be be their truth speak their truth uh but there's a lot of work to be done in this area because people are wrapped up in the societal uh pressure or conditioning of do the right thing and, you know, compromise. Mm, totally, totally. And so, you know, it's interesting when you talked about how it almost sounded like, you know, you had to escape and flee, you know, and that... Um... I'm sure he didn't see it. He wouldn't see it like that if he watches his back over. But at that time, that I jumped out of a moving car at one point. Well, and, and you know, and, that, <laughs> and that's... And that's, that's running away from, you know, what, what we all expect to be a, a nurturing, loving, you know, constructive situation. It's just, yeah. I mean, that's like, there's a whole other set of conversations. Oh, yeah. I think that's in the series. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's good. Um, the interesting thing that sort of came up to me there, and again, this is my experience. So my experience was, you know, I was the one that, that started to realise that, that there were expectations on me as a, as a partner, as a husband, that I, had, I hadn't been aware of and certainly had not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so I went about learning to fulfil those better and through that process realised that wasn't really who I was anyway. So again, I had committed to something that I had no idea I was committed to and no idea what it even was. Mm -hmm. And the more I realised what I committed to and what it was, the more I realised it wasn't who I am. Mm -hmm. and you know I hadn't suddenly become a bad person or anything else it's just the, the realization and acceptance of who I really was and the, yeah, the amount of compromise and, and I think it's, it's both ways in my, my relation my situation the amount of compromise meant that it you know even though I felt I gave it a go there was just no bridge left to build okay. you know? everything had been twisted and or destroyed completely. And so, you know, all of a sudden we've gone from this deep, not connected, <laughs> but deep, long relationship. History, long comfort, familiarity. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. to, to, to complete dysfunction. I mean, I understand what that word means now. 
mm. dysfunction of relationship, you know, mm -hmm. and and absolutely compromises at the core of that. Mm -hmm. And I still have people telling me that you know, compromise is important to a relationship, and and I I, I, I disagree with that violently mm -hmm. now because I I feel like we there's not a there's not a magic I don't believe in this magic situation where there's that one person where we just get along all the time magically. I don't believe in that. Yeah. But, uh, I believe that with conscious agreement and the mm -hmm. main of conscious agreement, then at, at worst, we can agree to decommit. I was having trouble hearing you. Sorry, I've just put the little headphone in again. So I love it because this is the poignant moment is where you're actually talking about conscious agreements. <laughs> can you hear me okay now? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So the, the, the simple I am a bit deaf, you know. Okay. I really am. <laughs> okay. okay, go ahead. That can serve you really well. <laughs> so, so, so the, the nub of it was that, you know, that I now, rather than compromise, I believe, I do believe that conscious agreement at the beginning, mm. part of that conscious agreement being to maintain that conscious agreement. Mm -hmm. And with the, say the, let's say the worst case being that as two independent, conscious, responsible adults, we agree to decommit if that's what is required. Uh huh. Got so it. Maintain our standards and maintain who we are. And so that's to me the healthy option. Yeah, and that's by design. Correct. Mm. So you're co-creating the agreement. Yes. You're coming from truth. You're coming from your truth. Yes. You are making an agreement, and then you proceed into that agreement with the expectation that any time. We want to, either party wants to relook at this. Let's have a conversation and, and talk about it and express. And it may well be that you end up course correcting, or um, sharing a perspective, and then you actually reset and you're good again, like going to the gym, or renegotiate something and actually, you know, redesign another layer to it or another uh, iteration. Right, and it's just constantly. Uh, designing agreements. Yes, totally. So, and and there's there's always good um, metaphors for these things. You know? Okay. So the uh, sailing is often a great metaphor. Okay. And in this case, it's a great metaphor because with sailing there is a clear goal. Okay. Yes. And with sailing, there are so many treacherous things along the way, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and what is required to make it, let alone win in a sailing race, is that ability to consciously to consciously and co constantly course correct so there is no way you're just going to sit there in a straight line and rely on everything to just work mm -hmm. and so course correction consciously being prepared to come together you know as a crew when there is a problem that appears bigger than you know than anyone anyone can master pulling together pulling resources all of these things serve us uh, in, a, in any relationship, I believe. Mm, that's so interesting. You know what? I think we could keep talking about this. Okay. So let's, ha let's, let's have an agreement to talk about conscious agreements. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Do I have your agreement? You have my agreement. <laughs> that's super. I love it. I think today we've achieved opening up the topic of conscious agreements, the distinction between conscious and unconscious agreements. And I guess really it's a happiness and positivity factor too because if you're fulfilled, most likely your, all your conscious agreements in your life are working well and when you're irritated or when, you know, you've had something bother you or there's something out of whack, rest assured uh, one of the agreements or the relationships, you know, isn't working and so that's a signal, it's feedback from life to say, hey, you're out of alignment. And this is an opportunity to go back and reset, retweak, mm. negotiate, communicate. Mm. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, just uh, and I appreciate you, Tanya, for keeping an eye on the time as you always do because I know we can go forever. Um, the thing I'd love to finish on there is that, you know, I'm, I, I am, I've, I've, I realised after, you know, so certainly hitting middle age that I'd, I'd been largely unconscious and, and that includes family, friends, career, you know, which has all been self-directed. Um, and so I now am consciously visiting all of those things. And, mm. and, you know, I'm doing my best not to feel there's something wrong with me or mm. anyone else in the equation. No. That's now a mismatch of expectations. Mm. And, and I say this because 
I understand the pain that can be there when we feel that someone's at fault. Mm-hmm. And it's not about fault. It's nothing no. about fault. And in fact, you've got a fantastic saying that I often quote. Okay. And that is along the lines of um, the, now, let me get it right. <laughs> the, all right, I'll say the second bit. You can tell us the first bit. The, the end is the non-vibrational match. Got it. I'm going to take these headphones out. Okay. There is no such thing as rejection. Only non-vibrational. Absolutely. There's no such thing as rejection, only a non-vibrational match. And what can happen is I think you go into an agreement and at that point in time you have a meeting of mind, heart, body, soul. There's connectology, my word. They're working. And then you grow. You go through life, the undulations of life, and then something shifts. Mm. Now, what that can happen too, I think, is mood. So, you know, you're, things are going well, you're in a great mood and all of a sudden this other person's not and they drop away. Mm. On our mood elevator from influential leadership, that model, you know, you, your moods are out, are misaligned. You're not on the same vibrational frequency. You're not on the same level. And you're not necessarily rejecting this person. It's just you're on a different level. So what are the choices? You drop and you drop the quality of your life and you spiral down and you get into a death spiral or... You invite the person up and this is where the opportunity to recalibrate comes in and not everyone wants to do it. They're happy in their misery. They're happy in their fear, uncertainty, doubt, complaining, bitching and belly aching and they're used to getting attention from that and they get attention and love mixed up. We get into that conversation that they stay here to do the drama but actually if you're here and you're on your journey and you're spiralling up, you haven't actually rejected them. They haven't rejected you just a different, it's a disconnect on the vibe level. Yes. And so, that, so having the courage to, to be convicted in, in where we're at and, you know, in, in compassion the open mm. uh, and allow things to transpire. Mm. I, I, I think letting go of the tension. Just for the sake of having that attachment. Not letting go of the person, not letting go of their value, not letting go of who they've been, just letting go of that attachment to satisfying them, you know, being everything for them has been a massive thing in, in me turning around my faith in life and my, my joy in life and those sorts of things. Yeah, amazing. Mm. Alistair, let's leave it there and we'll have an agreement to continue and do some more of these conversations. When I upload this, I'm going to leave the comments open. So if people who find this and watch this, uh, if they've got questions or anything, they could perhaps post them. Right. And then we'll, we'll do it also, we'll pop it up on Facebook. Right. You can push it out and I can push it out. And then from there, people who find it and locate it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have it somewhere sitting with Tanya Lacey online or Tanya Lacey community and you right. can pop it in your Alistair McDonald world and then we will, um, we'll, we'll do some more. Wonderful. But it naturally, uh, naturally uh, unfold rather than, uh, you know, try to uh, preempt everything about it. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, good. Well, Alistair, thank you for joining me on our, the little platform here. And I really enjoyed our conversation. Signing off and I'll put some links in below for where you can uh, find Alistair and myself and the Intercept experience and uh, our uh, respective paths and worlds that we each have as well as the stuff we have together. Thanks for watching and please follow the rest of the series as it unfolds and we all create it together. Thank you, Tanya. See you soon. Bye.